Hi, I'm Susan Krumholtz, a professor in Crime and Justice Studies and an affiliate with Women's Studies. My name is Heidi Berggren. I'm in Political mm -hmm. Science and Women's Studies, a joint appointment. And we're here today to talk about a subject that we both teach and we're both interested in, men and masculinities. So, uh, I guess we should begin with what we mean by masculinities. Masculinity is the gendered characteristics assigned to males. And just one note on this, um, th the difference for those of you who who haven't studied it, between sex and gender. Sex is biology, your physical biology. Gender is the social characteristics that you acquire. Masculinities, let me talk for a minute about um, why we're studying masculinities. Um, we never noticed that there was a masculine norm until we began to study uh, women. And so feminism is really what created the study of masculinities. And we're studying it for the purpose of understanding how and why patriarchy oppresses both women and men. What do we mean by patriarchy? Well, patriarchy is a system that uh, promotes male privilege. And it's really characterized by three aspects, um, male dominance, um, men are um, the definition of what is the norm in politics or the field of law. Uh, it's male identified, in other words, the characteristics that we give value to, rational, um, reasonable, are characteristics that are associated with being male. And finally, in a patriarchy, the everything, everything, the world, is male-centered. Men are the focus of attention, and what men do is how we understand what the world is. <coughs> so there are some themes in masculinity, and this probably answers your question, Heidi, of where do we get this from. Um, it comes from gender socialization, the opportunities or constraints that we have because of the gender we've been assigned. It comes from the um, privileges and problems that we experience throughout our life that are the result of who we are. Um, and it's really varied depending upon where we're situated in society. So what would that mean for a boy growing up today? Well, we still see very significant gender socialization today. So from the minute you're born, you're bought toys that are appropriate for a boy. Um, but we have seen some movement away from some very structured ideas. So now boys will help with household chores or do the laundry. Um, we, be, we even sometimes see boys um, playing with dolls in a way that was never allowed before. But the way you're socialized is going to have a lot to do with your class and your culture and how strictly they adhere to traditional roles. So where do all these influences come from? <coughs> well, R.W. Connell suggests that there are really three uh, large structures which dictate the gender order. Um, and those are the family, the state, and the street. And so let's talk a little bit about what each of those are. Um, the, the family, the gendered family, is seen as the foundation of society, and an anthropologist um, in anthropology, they argue a tremendous amount about whether every society has family and the extent to which family governs. But we know that family is very important in terms of the division of labor, in terms of uh, establishing power structures, who earns the income, who takes care of the household needs. And it also plays a part in the role of cathexis. What is cathexis? That's a really good question. Um, it, it's the investment of emotional significance in an activity, object, or idea. An, an example of cathexis excuse me, might be food. So feeding the family is considered to be the women's function. It often means love and caring, not just satisfying hunger. 
So the next structure that we're interested in is the state. And, and I know that this is what you study, and we'll be getting more to this um, later on in the presentation. But the state is really the place where they define what should be public versus private, which is an issue I'm very interested in studying intimate personal violence. Um, and this, as this slide says, the state arms men and disarms women. And I really like this. Um, of course, we don't mean it quite literally, although we could give it a literal interpretation. But um, what it really means is that the state prepares men um, for moving in the public sector and for achieving what they need to, and really disempowers women, um, or has historically done that. And so in that sense, it disarms women and keeps them from being able to survive on their own. Yes, but sometimes the state itself may be involved in trying to change the, the gendered order of things, or the traditionally gendered order of things. And But I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Good, that's very interesting. Um, and, and finally, we have reference to the street. And um, th though the state and the family really create gender norms, it, the street is where those are reinforced. The s by the street, we mean the interactions that one has with friends and community, how we should behave. And while women might, a, an example of the, um, the street dynamics and acceptable behavior, women might greet another woman with a hug and you wouldn't see men doing that. Um, so it's, it's less likely that, that a man's going to do that and more likely that they're going to give high five one another or give them a slap on the back. And that's because there's this persona that you need to present. <coughs> and, and that persona comes from the real power of masculinity. And so we talk about hegemony. And hegemony refers to the process by which the dominant culture maintains its dominant position. So here we're talking about the ideal of masculinity that will continue to maintain its centrality. And in the example I gave a moment ago, we saw that by requiring men to be tough, um, we really are allowing them to separate themselves socially from women. Um, and it's particularly interesting that men need the approval of other men, yet they're much more sensitive than women to assertions of homosexuality. Um, that's a really interesting sort of contradiction. How would you explain that? Where oh. does that come from? Well, I can tell you where the, um, the norms come from. Um, I'm not sure that in the little time we have here, I can explain to you why men um, are s so overreact to assertions of homosexuality. Um, but here are some of the, um, the requisite behaviors which can offer insight and which really result in sort of in locking us into our specific gender roles. The boy code, how you're taught to behave, the bravado that's tied in with being a boy, um, the gender straitjacket. And what we mean here is that, um, again, me men are really fixed in what they're allowed to do. Women have a lot more flexibility, perhaps because there's no concern about them maintaining their dominance. So for example, women can dress like men, pants, especially jeans and overalls are characteristically masculine, but for the last 40 years or so, women have been comfortable in them. Suits and ties are often fashionable for women. On the other hand, I can't imagine a man coming to school in a sundress even if it's a hot day and he might be more comfortable. And if you doubt that there are um, highly structured masculine positions, these pictures illustrate what we've been discussing. So I guess to sum up the the sociological piece of, of this presentation, um, we see what patriarchy is and the culture of patriarchy, um, which has the core value of controlling and dominating everything in our existence. So 
Okay, Heidi, um, now that I've talked about masculinity in societies and cultures, maybe you can talk about how the public policies either reward or, or reinforce or may in fact discourage mas traditional notions of, notions of masculinity. There are many different types of policies that do so, including those relating to reproductive rights, crime and punishment, which is Susan, your area, Susan, mm -hmm. um, health policy, and many, many other areas. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on work family policy. So what are the gender role implications of work family policy in the United States? Well, the FMLA, as you can see, is the legislation that set up work family policy in the United States. One, one good thing, on a positive note, you could say, uh, is it is gender neutral in terms of the, the wording. Um, it's not maternity leave, which specifies mothers, obviously a gendered term. Um, it's, it's gender neutral, so family and medical leave, and it's intended for, for parents or caregivers, um, or employees who have these specific needs. So in theory, this creates new possibilities for men to move away from breadwinning and provider identities and toward caring and nurturing. But these possibilities remain mostly unrealized. It's true that many millions of men and women have taken leave since this legislation went into effect in 1993. But most of the leave periods have been quite short because few families can afford to go on leave uh, for three months without, without pay, without a second income, that is. Um, and the longer periods of leave are mostly taken by women, partly because of their prime, partly because of their primary role in the earliest months of a child's life, and partly because men generally generally earn more um, than women. So clearly, there's the incentive for the male half of a couple to keep working, to be the one who is more closely connected with the with the world of paid labor. And of course, the legislation doesn't help single mothers at all. In short, you could say the transformative effects regarding gender roles are quite limited. In essence, in the United States, work family policy basically reinforces the status quo in terms of gender roles, with women working but being more connected with the family role and the reverse being the case for men. Um, there have been efforts to make the FMLA, FMLA paid but they have not gotten very very far yet. So are there any good models in other countries that might help us in viewing this issue? Yes, yes there are other countries. There's a statement here um, put out by the European Commission provides a definition of gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming? I haven't heard that term before. Does that mean that they're consciously trying to address gender inequities? As you can see, yes. Um, family and parental leave and other types of work family policies are part of this larger gen gender mainstreaming effort in many European countries. We'll see that the possibilities for the state and public policy to redefine both masculinity and femininity are much larger than in the United States. And what does this picture suggest to you? Well, on one level, it shows the need for a gender perspective in education policy if women are ultimately going to play larger roles in public life. In this case, it might be university provision of childcare. But what about masculinity? Aren't we focusing here on men and masculinities? Yes, we are. So on another level, this picture is notable for what it doesn't show, which is a man struggling to get an education while he simultaneously cares for his children. One of the goals of gender mainstreaming is to get men more involved in caring and nurturing children, which really is inseparable from the goal of women's greater involvement in work and in the public sphere. Swedish policy does seek to, fi to facilitate men's involvement in childcare and family life. This is a great poster. How does Sweden do that? Well, their parental leave policy, in short, in addition to providing long periods of leave, very long, several years in some cases, 
and they also provide generous income replacement. Um, it also includes, quote unquote, daddy months. These are use it or lose it months, wherein um, the family loses part of the leave entitlement unless the father takes the leave himself. So this is clearly intended to create an incentive for, for men to take advantage of the leave to get them more involved in, in yeah. caring and nurturing work. As, as I understood it, several countries had problems even when they offered leave to men that they weren't really taking it. Right, and that's, that's, that's part of the reason behind um, Sweden's policy. And even in Sweden, as we'll see a little bit later in the presentation, um, men's leave taking appears to have increased and perhaps as a response or in part as a response to the policy incentives. But it's still a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question. Um, but in order to promote this policy or the, the availability of the father's month, the Swedish government has actively publicized these particular father's leave entitlements. They've been available since 1974, if you can believe it. Um, but the government has tried to publicize these entitlements through educational and informational campaigns. These campaigns emphasize the benefits to fathers as distinct from benefits uh, for children and mothers. There are similar efforts in Denmark. And this is a picture from um, a pamphlet that employers have on hand to give to their employees, encouraging fathers to, uh, to take leave. Ah, uh, <laughs> these are great pictures, but have these efforts been successful? Well, as you can see, men's share of leaves is still small compared to, to women's, but it's, it is rising. Perhaps the economic incentives and the advertising campaigns carried out by the Swedish government are making a difference. Uh, this concludes our presentation. We hope that it got you interested in the subject and that you'll have more questions. My interests are to look at physical aggression since I study crime and why men commit so much more interpersonal crime than women do. Heidi? Yes, and I'm interested in whether or not work family policies, such as Sweden's that we just talked about, can change the way people think about gender roles. So it's not just a matter of changing behavior, but also the way people think. And how about you?